and welcome. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. We are going through this initial period now where I'm welcoming you to the show, but we found that it usually takes people a little while to get seated and get comfortable and get their drinks and uh, kind of arrive and get settled for the show. So welcome to Risk. We have such a phenomenal group of storytellers today and such phenomenal stories that I am just thrilled to like be trying this out at a different time of day. We wanted to try to appeal to some of our European fans today and see how that worked. So this is gonna be super, super, super fun. We're thrilled to have you here. You know, I've been thinking about all the weird things that often happen at risk live shows, you know? <laughs> like the ones that happen when the audience is there in person and how it might be different now. You know, weird things I think are still going to be happening, like cat bombing, for example, or me coming on screen and seeing JC rather than myself as the featured uh, picture on screen. So. <laughs> Weird things are going to happen, but weird things happen when we do the show live on stage as well. I remember I was in San Francisco doing the show one year, and I don't know what I was saying, but apparently I was being incredibly lovable because a gal in the front row, who I think had had her share of ecstasy that night, just got right out of her seat, walked right up on stage to give me a big old hug, and I did not react well. I did not, I, I was just like, oh no, we don't do that, we don't do that. I mean, you know, she could have been an assassin, right? I mean, we know they're all out there and waiting. But I also remember, one year, Greg Fitzsimmons told a story at a uh, Los Angeles live show and the craziest fucking thing happened. He was telling a story where he was like, um, oh, I used to live in this strange little suburb outside of Boston, up on a hill, and someone in the audience shouted out, Hillside Road? And he was like, yeah. And he was, the person shouted out, were you in the cul-de-sac? He was like, yeah. And so he was like, well, anyway, would you please quiet down so I can tell my story? And he, he went on to talk about this fella in the neighborhood who he suspected personally, like no one ever really talked about it, but Greg suspected that this man was an active pedophile. And then the guy in the audience just shouted out, you mean John Sullivan? <laughs> <laughs> we had to cut that out of the show because Greg was like, yeah. <laughs> and then there was also a crazy occasion where we did the show in Atlanta and a gal got so drunk before getting up on stage that she like could not tell her story. And it was the funniest story. It was a story about how one night she was having the dream date. It was her Prince Charming, a guy that she had been just like so determined to eventually sleep with. Like they had been having all this romance, these perfect first several dates. Finally, they were sleeping together, but they got a bit drunk before they went to bed. She woke up in the middle of the night and she realized there was something soggy and brown underneath her butt in the bed. So she was terrified. She's like, did I poop the bed with Prince Charming for the first time we're sleeping together? So she got up out of bed and she started trying to do that thing where you pull uh, the, the sheets out from under something in hopes that he would just kind of roll over her and she could like get rid of the evidence. Well, he woke up and he said, what on earth is going on? And she just broke down. She was like, I'm so sorry. I think I might have crapped the bed. Oh, and God. Like, oh, no, no, sweetheart. No, 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 no. I got so drunk that I got hungry in the middle of the night and I decided to have a snack. And I guess somehow I left it under your ass. <laughs> 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 and so she gets to that point in the story. She's telling this to the audience, and it had taken her a million years to get to this point in the story because she was so, so drunk that she finally had to reveal what it was underneath herself, the, the snack that she had been sitting on. 
And she said, and that's why I find it so funny to reveal that it was a, uh, and she couldn't say it. She just started laughing and laughing and laughing and laughing in her drunken state. And she was like, sorry, 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 I'm so sorry. It was uh, laughing, 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 laughing. The audience was dying laughing with her, but eventually it became uncomfortable. You know, it's the kind of thing where the funny thing keeps happening until it's just like, is the computer program just not running anymore? So finally, I had to come out on stage, wrap my arms around on her and escort her off because she was just like loose. She was in tears. She was just completely out of sorts. And that's when I revealed to the audience, it was a ho ho. <laughs> <laughs> so be careful, you know, you, you, you might not be so bad off having a ho underneath you for that first night, but uh, ho ho, that can be a little bit sketchy. So gang, I'll tell you what we're going to do. One of the things we want to do tonight, or today, wherever you are, is to run some trivia questions by you. See, out, see who out there might be uh, plugged into risk and, uh, you know, know the answers to some of these trivia questions. And there will be a prize for one of them this first session. And then there will be a prize for one of them in the intermission session of trivia as well. Oh, and by the way, if you're interested in sending us trivia questions, if you're a big Risk fan and love trivia in general, send some of yours to me as well. If you go to the Risk Podcast Fans Discussion Group, I put up a post about it. You can DM me on Facebook and send in yours, and maybe we'll read some of your trivia questions. Okay, let me read the first one that comes up here. Oh, and by the way, you just put your answers you should send your answers to JC at Risk Podcast Host. You can, you know, JC, you can send it to her privately in the chat, right? At Risk Podcast Host. So that, well, you know what? Let's not do that. Don't, don't send it privately. Instead, just, just send in your answers and JC will go off of whoever answers first. Okay, first trivia question. Name two biological sounds that Kevin Allison has recorded himself making to mix into the audio of the show. <laughs> two biological sounds that I have recorded myself making to mix into the audio of the show. Oh my gosh. <laughs> have I ever? I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is orgasm and belching. I don't think I've ever recorded myself farting. Uh, I might, I might have faked. I might have faked some farts out, uh, there. Uh, oddly enough, it's the belching that has gotten the the most upset out of people. People don't seem to mind hearing me like sounding like I'm dying having an orgasm, but the belching <laughs> some people find extremely offensive. Uh, um, okay. Did, did, we, did we determine who answered that right first? Yeah, it was uh, Felix Berry, orgasm and burp. Felix Berry, Felix Berry, <laughs> good Lord. What a good risk fan you are. Um, let me give the next uh, trivia question here. This one is pretty, pretty easy. It's good to mix up easy ones with difficult ones. And then the, le the third one will be pretty difficult and we'll see who can get that one right. Uh, so this one is, where, according to one of Risk's sponsors, do you just not have the time to go? <laughs> where, according to one of our sponsors, do you just not have the time to be going? Um, ba -ba 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 -ba. Oh, yeah, I puked. I puked. That is a good point. I did puke on the show once. <laughs> we did have a recording of me puking, so I guess that is another bodily thing. We should change that trivia question. Oh my goodness gracious. Thank you, Annette May Pierce. Um, <laughs> okay, but the next question is... Uh, Do we want the winner from that one? Yeah, I don't know why um, my chat gets stuck. Okay. Uh, Camille Deering won the uh, question about the post office. Awesome. Let me make the third one actually a little bit of an easier one as well. Now for this one, you can win free tickets to the next risk live stream. If you're the first person to answer this question 
correctly. And it is, ba -ba 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 -ba, at what solemn event did storyteller P.S. Madison end up lamenting the loss of a high quality pin? Somebody got it. Sounds. So we, we have a winner. I lost the tape. It's frozen. Kevin, are you stuck? Uh oh, I'm gonna put myself on. Oh, okay, Kevin, now you're unstuck. So yeah, we have a winner. Uh, it's Samantha Redkey. Okay. Okay. Let me switch my um. See if my 5G is more um. Better. Hello, hello, hello. Everyone hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay, great, great, great. Okay, so Samantha it was, right? We'll yeah, get Samantha free, Red Key. We'll get free tickets to the next, next Risk live stream. Now I think I can hand it over to JC, who will explain how the show is going to work. And then we'll come back to me, and I'll get the show started. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, all around the world, please welcome the stage, your friend and mine, Kevin Allison and Risk. Yeah. Hello, 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 everyone. We are so thrilled to be having our third live stream show. The first two were so phenomenal, so inspiring. And today I'm just so excited because we've got some really great, great storytellers and stories to share today. Um, if you're new to Risk, which I doubt you are, but if you're new to Risk, I always have to explain that Risk is the show where people tell true stories they never thought they'd dare to share which means it's the kind of stories you're probably not going to be hearing on NPR. I remember we did the show in, in DC once and a fellow was backstage and he ran into a friend of his backstage who was like using the bathroom. And the friend said, what is this show that you're appearing on tonight? He explained that it was risk and and, and the friend said, well, what's, what's the whole concept? And he said, well, it's kind of like people telling stories that you think, oh my gosh, where should I share that story? I guess I should take that story really just to my therapist. And then you think to yourself, wait a minute, I'm not sure that I want to lay that all on her. I should probably just take it to risk. <laughs> So that's where we are. We are here at risk. Stories that go all over the map, stories some that are sad, some that are beautiful, some that are kinky, some that are uh, scary. We are all over the map and we are completely uncensored. And I thought I would start us off with this ridiculous story of mine about something that happened to me almost precisely 10 years ago. It was just a couple of weeks ago, 10 years ago, that a friend got in contact with me and he said, oh my gosh, Kevin, I've got a new job working for the Guinness Book of World Records. Would you like to come on to our show? We're going to do a live show and we're going to see if some of the performers could actually do something within the five or 10 minutes we allow them to be on stage. That could be a world record. We're going to have actual like committee members from the Guinness Book of World Records sitting there on stage to judge whether or not some of these might be legit records. So can you think of something that you could do on stage that, you know, maybe no one's ever done before? <laughs> so not long and hard about it. And then I remembered that when I was 30, I had this therapist, and I talked about her on a recent live stream. She was a big part of my life because she fucked me up in so many ways, so there's lots of stories about her. Her name was Agatha, 
and she was a very goth sort of woman. But what I didn't realize when I first started seeing this therapist was that she was pretty sex negative. You know, that's a problem for me because I am a gay, kinky, polyamorous pervert, not such a great match for someone who's a little <clears throat> uptight about sexuality. So it was about a month into seeing Agatha every, uh, every week when she said to me, <laughs> you know, Kevin, I think we're going to have to address the fact that you are obviously a little bit too fixated on the anus. And so what I would like you to do is to go home and get out a notebook and do not allow the pen to stop writing on the page. I want you to write and write and write continuously, coming up with at least 300 metaphors for the anus. And see what that does to you psychologically. Well, I was thrilled with this assignment. I went home, I got out a notebook, I was ready. I was like, I'm just gonna write and write and write and not let the pen leave the page until I have come up with at least 300 metaphors for the anus. And it was such a turn on. It was such a rush. I came up with this amazing, like Walt Whitman-esque poem, just celebrating in so many ways my favorite thing. But I have to admit, toward the end of making the list, I started to cheat a little bit. I switched, because I was kind of running out of ideas for metaphors for the anus, I kind of switched to my favorite thing to do to an anus. I switched to the activity that I think of when I think of anuses, and that is rim jobs. So the end of the list was actually 62 metaphors, euphemisms for rim jobs, right? So when my friend from the Guinness Book of World Records approached me and said, what could you do on stage in about 10 minutes that, you know, probably no one else could do, I was like, I can read off 62 metaphors for rim jobs. Who's done that before? I don't think anyone has. Well, when I first got up on that stage, there were those like five committee members from the Guinness Book of World Records, and I announced what I was going to do, and they went a little bit pale. I will tell you, they looked a little bit concerned about what was about to happen. It certainly wasn't, I think, in the realm of your typical Guinness Book of World Records sort of feat. But there was nothing to be worried about because these metaphors were so delightful. In fact, so delightful. I'm going to run through them for you now. Who out there would like to hear? Yay. 62 Yay. Yes, of course. rim job. <laughs> I love them so much. Let's see. Let's start with this one. Number one, kiss in the south mouth. I like that one because it's kind of genteel, you know? It's got kind of a Southern charm to it, like, like Blanche from the Golden Girls might call it that way. Number two, greasing the rusty wheel. Number three, mumbling to Rosebud. <laughs> Number four, crunching on famous anus. It's a little bit of a stretch, you know, famous Amos still exists, the cookies, right? That's what I kind of had in mind there. Number five, sweeping the poop shoot. Some of these start to get a little bit scatological, which is not necessarily, you know, a part of uh, the traditional rim job, but you know, every now and then someone might want to go a little bit further with things. Uh, six, the brown eye flush. <laughs> Seven, biting the bung. I think that should be biting the bung hole, right? That, that might not make sense. A lot of these don't make any sense at all. Uh, eight, snacking on the mud shrimp. Yeah, that one starts to get downright two girls, one cup. Um, nine, grazing on the goose hole. 
why a goose hole? I don't know. You know, like geese are pretty funny in general. <laughs> 10, drooling on the dumplings. Not sure if that one makes sense. Oh, 11 is a good one. Gargling arse. 12, goblin the gunwale. I don't know what a gunwale is, but I was reading Moby Dick at the time. 13, the blowhole slur slurpee. Again, clearly Moby Dick there. 14, French and Le Derriere. Perfect. <laughs> Although I'm not sure if it should be la or le for the derriere there. 15, going downstairs for breakfast. 16, browning out. 17, mushing the tush. <laughs> 18, moving to Brownsville. It's a lot of brown involved in these at this point. 19, ass blow. 20, muffin the bran pipe. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but it's got muffins and bran in it. Uh, 21, oil in the coin slot. 22, sphincter spritzing. 23, buttering the cornhole. 24, spitting in the bucket. 25, lick the can. Do people still play uh, kick the can? I used to love that game when I was a kid. Uh, 26, tie in the balloon knot. Balloon knots, so anal, are they not? <laughs> 27, <laughs> gluteal gorging. Uh, 28, <laughs> ring around the kisser. 29, cheeks to cheeks. <laughs> Perfect. 30, smothering in flesh pillows. 31, bottom feeding. Uh, 32, loosening the caboose. I'm not sure if that makes sense. 33, making out on the back porch. 34, can feasting. Uh, 35, moistening the bonbons. <laughs> As you have to do every now and then. 36, sewer chewing. Uh, 37, bridging the crevice. 38, chewing the bud. 39, noshing at the hindquarters. 40, bobbing the dimple. 41, bringing water to the moon. 42, glazing the ham. 43, water in the old dusty road. 44, basting the round round. Oh, 45 is great. Lickety split. There you go. 46. <laughs> Luncheon on the haunches, 47, partaking of the posterior, 49, hooven in the boom boom room. Now, the hooven means like a vacuum cleaner? I don't know if that makes sense. Uh, 49, eat and seat, 50, fits in the keister, 51, a gay down south in Dixie. <laughs> 52, sit and spin, 53, smooch and tush. 54, supper where the sun don't shine. 55, mud flat make out. 56, tongue juggling in the center ring. Tongue juggling <laughs> in the center ring, my friends. A little circus analogy there. 57, up for the behind. 58, <laughs> snack in the box. 59, glutton for punishment. <laughs> <laughs> 60, quenching the chocolate rose. Uh, 61, anal tasting, and 62, bum suckling. <laughs> oh my goodness, what an accomplishment it was to come up <laughs> with all of those wonderful euphemisms and metaphors. But let me tell you something. When I brought that list back to Agatha, <laughs> my therapist, I was so excited. She said, how did it go? I said, well, here's the list. And she said, well, I don't really care about the list. How did it feel? And I said, oh, well, it was exhilarating. I had so much fun. In fact, it, it really made me horny. I had to jerk off afterwards. And she said, oh, no, Kevin. I said, oh, no. She said, it was supposed to make you exhausted. It was supposed to make you, you know, tired of this this grotesque and infantile obsession of yours. 
And I was like, well, I'll tell you something. <laughs> it did not help me get over it. But that experience did help me get over Agatha because I got rid of her as a therapist not too long after. <laughs> but I'll tell you something. As soon as I finished that list up there on stage for the Guinness Book of World Records, you're probably wondering, you know, did, did I win? Did I win? Am I in the Guinness Book of World Records now? I'm telling you, I could tell you, you know, you'll have to go out and buy the book, but I'm not going to tell you that because of course those motherfuckers didn't have the integrity and the honor and the taste to see what an achievement I had made there. So it's not in the Guinness book, but it's right here right now for you today. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my goodness gracious, folks, we have such a wonderful lineup tonight and I'm so excited to bring our first storyteller up to the virtual stage. Now, he is currently on BBC One on the show Our Girl and he has, I think this is a film coming out, The Outpost coming out by Millennial Films with Orlando Bloom and Scott Eastwood that is coming soon. He told such a wonderful, delightful story the last time that Risk was physically in London. What a wonderful time that was. Please welcome to the stage right now, but first I have to ask him, are you recording and have you adjusted your mic setting? I have and I have. <laughs> Fabulous. Please welcome to the virtual stage, Will Attenborough. Thank you so much. I. Uh... I'll be honest, I was pretty nervous uh, about like, you know, sharing the content of my story and then uh, Kevin gave us 62 synonyms for rimming. And now I'm sort of like, well, I mean, there's not much to lose at this point. I, I think I found the right room for this story. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so my story is about locker rooms. I have, I have a fantasy about locker rooms. Uh, I went to an all boys, quite posh, um, private school here in London. Uh, we wore uniforms, we wore a tie, we played rugby. It was, it was mostly horrifying. But, um, you know, the, the fantasy of all those kind of rugby boys uh, coming back to the, the locker room after sports and getting undressed and, and like all that machismo and repression, like melting into a massive orgy was like a fantastic idea. However, Obviously that never actually took place at school. And when I did actually come out, I was 20 years old. Um, I'd left high school, I was at university. And by this point I was so scared. I'd internalized so much fear and anxiety that despite the fact I'd just come out, I was too afraid to actually have sex with another man. Oh. For a while, for like two years. Um, and so I just continued uh, sleeping with women. And um, since I was very much at the time identifying as gay and yet sleeping exclusively with girls, my friends pointed out that technically, well, that makes you a lesbian. <laughs> um, and it was during this lesbian period that I would sort of, you know, I'd try to um, go to gay bars and I would find them too pressurized and intense. I'd, I'd go on dates with guys, but honestly, I would be sort of counting down the minutes until I could go home and kind of just put that to one side. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, I'd hidden this stuff since I was about 10 years old. And if any of those rugby boys had, had known what I was thinking about doing with them, they would have kicked the crap out of me. <laughs> so, you know, like I'm 20 years old, I'm, I'm a lesbian, and uh, <laughs> I am uh, starting to get really, really worried that I'm never gonna break out of this. And the longer it doesn't happen for me with a guy, the bigger deal it becomes. And uh, on a darker level, I start to feel like I'm a failure because the queer people that I knew at university were these like out proud personalities. They were really inspiring and very, seemed very much to be authentically themselves. And I thought, why aren't I like that? Like, why can't I be more comfortable, more proud? Why am I so ashamed? I felt ashamed of having, of having shame. Uh, and I, I kind of thought that the way to deal with this 
is to um, do like a queer version of manning up, to kind of do like a gay up, like kind of like be a gay. And I made a decision one evening that I was just gonna go not to 100 and just kind of like break my way out of it um, by going to a gay bathhouse. <laughs> and I remember having this kind of peculiar uh, calm, this kind of serene confidence in making that choice. I think I was, I was pretty drunk as well, but I, I, but I remember feeling like I don't uh, feel pressured to, uh, to do this. I want to do it. And bathhouses, for if there's anyone out there who's uninitiated, although presumably in this audience, you're all down there regularly. Um, <laughs> but if for anyone, if anyone out there has not been to a gay sauna, a gay bathhouse, they are uh, they're fascinating places. They're kind of um, halfway between a gym and a nightclub, I would say. They, they, they kind of tend to be um, comprised of darkly lit corridors that lead off to various gyms and uh, gyms, um, uh, uh, showers and steam rooms and saunas and sex rooms. And they're known as like a place you could go if you wanted to hook up with a stranger. And so that is, that's where I go. Um, I find online there's a, a, a gay sauna in Soho here in London and um, I had had fantasies about these places I mean obviously I'm 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 the locker room guy um, and uh, I sort of looked them up online and there's pictures of like these overly muscled men who are kind of hanging out in these saunas and they look like they're having a fantastic time um, and so quite excitedly I get on the tube and I go down to this sauna but when I get outside, my confidence falters. I feel um, increasingly apprehensive. I'm stood in this like alleyway that stinks of piss a little bit. And I'm looking at this kind of red metallic door out of which every now and then emerges a kind of flush looking sweaty man who looks a little bit sheepish. Uh, and it's not quite as enticing as I had hoped, but I, I, I screw up my courage and I open that door and I remember this feeling of unreality as I'm doing it. Like, it's, it's almost like um, when you see someone who's quite famous in the flesh and you're like, oh, this is really, this is real. This is happening and I'm doing it, I'm here. I open this door, I greet this um, very sweet guy who's like, you know, working on the desk and it turns out they are doing a student deal that night, which was great for me. So I get a, get a cheaper ticket and, um, I'm sent down to the changing room. The changing room is brilliant, not for a sexual reason, but brilliant because the changing room is like the last bastion of British politeness, where just for this one final moment, everyone is just pretending that it's like, it's another day, and they're just, you know, they're gonna fold up their trousers and put their shirt away, and then we'll probably all go and have sex, but it's just sort of like, no, after you, you know, please, please. <laughs> incredibly endearing. I'm very um, guarded though. I, I get undressed. Uh, I put my clothes in this like little red metallic locker and I've been given this little towel that I wrap around myself and there's nothing else to do <laughs> but enter the belly of the bathhouse. <laughs> I'm very nervous. I'm hit by this sort of um, this thick smell of chlorine and sweat and it feels kind of swampy and moist underfoot uh and i observe the first thing i observe is this really peculiar phenomenon that i've only ever seen in like the few london bathhouses that i've been to but it's this thing where like everyone there is sort of is sort of walking around a bit quickly and kind of looking around <laughs> looking around them as they go and I couldn't figure out what it was at first, but then I realized like, the bathhouse is like this wordless environment, at least in England, because we're so ashamed, um, but no one really talks to each other. So all the sexual liaisons kind of run off eye contact. And if you hold it for long enough with someone, that means like, okay, like this is on. So you want to have the balance between like scoping out what's it, like who's available but without starting something that you don't mean to start so everyone's just sort of like having a little <laughs> like a little commute around the <laughs> around the sauna and i find myself like kind of joining the thoroughfare it's actually a little it's not dissimilar to what we're all doing like when we go to the supermarket at the moment everyone's sort of like 
Where are you? Are you going there? I'm not going. You're wearing a mask. Is that a good or a bad thing? And everyone's sort of like ooh, sizing each other up day to day. And so I'm doing this little quick walk. And um, despite the fact that there's this kind of surreal introduction, what I like about it, what I feel comforted by, is that it is a purely gay space. It's just gay men. And that is, um, that's safe. There's something safe about that. And also, none of them know me. So I don't have to be the like, you know, 12 year old at the old boys school. I can be free. And I eventually find what looks to be the smallest like room in the bathhouse. It's this little sauna that just has one guy in it sat at the far end. And I feel his eyes on me as I walk in and I sit down on that kind of hot bench. He's older, he's probably like mid to late thirties, he's bald. Um, and though I'm really frightened, my heart is just like pumping away. I'm very exhilarated that I'm kind of this close. <laughs> and by way of invitation to this unnamed man, uh, I decide to just lean back and open my towel. And I sense him get up, come over to me. We look at each other, he smiles, and we start, you know, <laughs> we start, we start <laughs> hooking up with each other. And I was like, oh my God, it's, it's happening. It's, oh my, this is actually happening. It's finally happening. Like not, a, I, not out loud, this is all an internal monologue, but I couldn't believe that I was finally breaking this kind of, uh, elusive experience. And it wasn't amazing. I mean, you know, I don't even, I'd not even like, I didn't even know his name. We hadn't spoken, but it was just, um, it was sort of such a relief that it was, that I was finally doing it. And after about five minutes of us, I guess, like going down on each other, I start to sense that there are other guys who've like come into this room and they're all standing around. And I think they're kind of watching us and, then a couple of these guys like start touching me. <laughs> I start touching them and then there's like six, seven guys and they're all joining in and it's fantastic. <laughs> and I'm just astonished that like the fantasy is here, it's in the world. Like I'm in the locker room. <laughs> 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 and uh, when I have finished, I, afterwards, I feel so liberated because it's like, if that fantasy that I was convinced was gonna get me, you know, lynched, uh, has actually uh, existed safely in the real world, then maybe that little kid, you know, the 12 year old who was terrified as well can come and exist in the real world as well. And though that is largely the kind of positive note that I left, the bathhouse on, there's one thing that I notice before I go. And that is that when you're in um, the kind of like sauna, steam room, sexy area, everyone looks very much the same. Everyone's just got the same little towel wrapped around them. Nobody has anything on that really distinguishes them or identifies them in any way. So everyone kind of becomes just this body that's moving around in the darkness. And that is part of what's so freeing about it. But then you go back into the changing room and you see these guys put their clothes back on and you start to see them with all the little signals that they give out day to day. Like, oh, that, wow, he, those, he likes those kind of shoes. Or like that guy has a little satchel. I wonder if he's a student or something. And there's an older guy who's sort of got a smart button up shirt and maybe he's come straight from work before he goes home and I wonder what home means for him and there's this whole kind of variety there and some guys wear like um little wife fronts or, or uh tighty whities as you guys call them in the states <laughs> like little white briefs and they suddenly look so boyish and sort of childlike and I can see that they are vulnerable and embarrassed and and probably ashamed in the same ways that I am and though it was such a like freeing exploration to just dive in at the deep end like that, ultimately what I really want is to meet that guy who's got the satchel and the wife fronts and to have something 
connected and real with that person. And I'm 28 now. And if I'm being completely honest, I haven't, I just, I haven't had that yet. But I think doing enough of this, <laughs> uh, uh, I know I am, I am going to get there. Aww. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Thank you. Will Attenborough, that was so phenomenal. Oh my gosh, I could relate to that story so, 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 so much. It's ridiculous. You know, in my 20s and 30s, really, I, I was so terrified about talking to guys at gay bars i that was a well it's still it's still actually a, a bit of a source of severe social anxiety for me uh that all of my friends knew that if i was coming to any gay male social occasion my friends would joke kevin will be gone in about a half hour to go to one of the bathhouses because i noticed right away when i started going to these things that when you enter the door, it's almost as if you're entering into the unconscious. There are a lot of guys who go to these bathhouses or sex clubs uh, that are married to women or just living entirely different lives and who prefer not a place where nothing is spoken and it's almost as if they are not in the real world. And I remember I told my therapist, Agatha, about this one time. And she said, interesting. I think it would be helpful for you if you would picture the next time you go to your favorite bathhouse, a sign above the door saying, abandon hope all ye who enter here. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? Agatha, that was the most... <laughs> Like <laughs> sex negative thing I think I've ever heard a therapist say. But anyway, one of my favorite examples of how people are in these sex clubs is in my 30s, there was this guy that I always saw at the same sex club, this uh, Latino guy who was just, oh my gosh, so, so beautiful. And we would play every time I came to, it was just once a week, we would play, we would play, we would play. This went on for like a year. And finally, I was like, this is ridiculous. I come here just to play with him. Why don't I just get his fucking number? So we played one night at this club. And after the orgasms had been had, <laughs> I pulled him aside and I said, can I get your number? And he looked like a deer in the headlights. People just don't talk at these clubs. And I had, I had dared to not only talk, but to ask him about something from the real world, his phone number. So he, he just went pale and he responded, ah, it's in Spanish. <laughs> I was like, oh, gotcha. Yeah, I can't have your number. It's in Spanish, uh, so, you know. Anyway, I wanna bring our next storyteller to the stage. She has told so many classic stories on Risk, both radio stories and live stories, and she has her own show that normally happens in Long Island, but today, it's going on later today at 4, 4 p.m. Uh, uh, Pacific time, 7 p.m. New York time. Her show is called Mostly True Things. And if you go to mostlytruethings.com, you can find out how to get in on the Zoom for this evening's uh, show. She's also been on Stories from the Stage on PBS and the, done Stories for the Story District. Please welcome to the virtual stage. Oh, wait, first I have to ask. <laughs> Jude, are you recording and is your mic level set? I set my mic level. I am recording. I have the things all going. <laughs> Fabulous. <laughs> Please welcome to the virtual stage, Jude Trader Wolf. Thank you. Thank you. Oh my gosh. It's very exciting to uh, tell a story that as a therapist, I don't tell very many people, but now I'm just going to tell everybody. 
So I am standing in the waiting area of my therapist's office and she's running a little bit late, which isn't unusual for her. And I don't usually mind it. So I wouldn't usually feel impatient, but I'm on these fertility hormones that have all of my emotions heightened dramatically. So I feel kind of wildly agitated. These hormones make my body release extra eggs so that I can be harvested, you know, like mother goose for in, for, for in vitro fertilization. And they make all of my emotions over the top and I don't actually have very much control over them, especially anything remotely pregnancy related. Like if I see uh, a Toys R Us or a baby dill, because it looks like a fetus. And I love Danielle. She's helped me for four years as I've been navigating this process. I have what's called unexplained infertility, but it's actually inexplicable. I had come from a family of eight kids. My mother had 11 pregnancies. I have 42 first cousins. I was an aunt in third grade. Every vision I have of myself as an adult is a mother of three. I don't know if I'm going to get married ever in the past, but I always knew I would be a mother of three. Uh, and I would organize my entire professional life so that I could control my hours and my husband and I can hand off childcare. Everything is in place except to actually, for, to raise a family, except the actual family. So there's a lot I have to talk to Danielle about. And here at age 39 at this point, they talk about my uterus like it belongs in a museum. It's not easy to take either. So Danielle opens the door. I walk in. I'm no longer annoyed with her because just looking at her, I feel that surge of love. She has this demeanor about her that I, that, that's so calming. First, she has these brown eyes that are dripping with empathy. She's a combination of style and substance with Jennifer Aniston from Friends kind of hair. And she has this way of talking like an earth mother. She's sort of like the lab technician that get, that's giving you the results and everything is going to be fine. That's the way she talks all the time. And I say, finally, after four years and all these doctors and all these tests, I have an actual diagnosis for my condition. My body is allergic to sperm. Yes. <laughs> I paralyze sperm. My body actually tries to kill. I'm a sperm killer. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and Danielle leans back and she says, well, how do you feel about that? And I say, I feel hopeful. Finally, with a diagnosis, now they can actually treat it instead of just throwing everything at me because they don't know what else to do. She gets very quiet. And she says, you know, I, I'm a specialist in this. And I have to tell you that women with this condition have about a 7% chance of ever achieving conception. And if you do conceive, your body is going to reject the pregnancy. And I say, oh, I see. I'm not even supposed to marinate in just a little bit of hope for a little while with you. And she says, of course you can have hope. I want you to have hope. But there are so many things you can do with your life. If this dream doesn't happen for you, there are so many things you can do with your life that you might not do if you did have children. And maybe it's time to talk about some of those roads you could go down. And my anger spikes from zero to 10 because I have all these emotional uh, agitation in me. And I say, oh, that's easy for you to say. You have four children. I bet you didn't even have any trouble getting pregnant. Great, great, great. And she says, I know you're angry, but you're really not angry with me. You're angry with this information. And I go, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm a sperm killer, but I'm not a killer of other people's dreams. And I walk out. I walk out of therapy, something I've never done before. And I get home and I fire Danielle over the phone. And then I call this therapist that I had been thinking about for a month or two that I had read about in New Age Magazine, because in 1996, this New Age Magazine is a thing. There was a huge feature article about this woman named Brenda from Brooklyn Heights. She calls herself a mind-body specialist in fertility, and she claims a 96% success rate. I call Brenda. She talks the way a therapist you found in New Age Magazine talks, exactly what you would imagine. Namaste. Um, thank you for take, welcoming me on your journey, this very painful and difficult journey that you're going through. I want you to know that I'm going to send you 
a, an intake form that I would like you to give me exhaustive details about your mother's pregnancies, about your pregnancies among all of your siblings and your father's family history and all of these questions. And then we will discuss it when you come in. I charge $250 an hour. Your first appointment must be two hours and I don't take any insurance. In two weeks. She's so zen, I'm in. She, I, she sends me the intake form. I fill it out. There's questions I've never been asked before. I, I show up in Brooklyn Heights. It's two hours from my house. And I get to her address. And there's a big wrought iron fence that has two buzzers on it that I have to walk through. Then a labyrinthine shrubbery path to her front door. I get to the front door and I ring it. And then I hear click, 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 five clicks on her front door. And then I think, wow, she sounded so Zen, but she seems awfully worried about security. I don't, I don't, anyway, she opens the door and there's Brenda and she has streaming white hair, like women who run with wolves. And she's wearing a Stevie Nicks would wear this on stage, kind of diaphanous dress, many beads around her neck. All she really needs is a tambourine. She says, namaste, welcome. Welcome. The higher power within me is going to work with the higher power within you. And we're going to work through this difficult journey. I've already read your intake and I, I know exactly where to begin. Follow me. And she's, she floats down the, this kind of labyrinthine hallway of her apartment. I begin to think maybe she's not so relaxed as she is stoned. I'm not sure. <laughs> But I'm here now. I'm in. We, when I follow her downstairs. We go into this basement. She sits down and she says, I've read your intake. Now, you shared that when your mother gave birth to your sister and you were three years old, that she was paralyzed for almost a year after that birth. Is that correct? And I say, yes, that is correct. And she says, do you see the parallel? She was paralyzed and you paralyze the sperm. She was paralyzed. You paralyze the sperm. This is where we're going to begin our work. And I think, okay, um, I don't even, I barely remember that. I was two and a half years old when it happened. And she says, remember the rage, remember the fear of your mother, everything you can remember. We're going to bring up those emotions and we're going to release those toxins today. And she goes into a closet and she takes out these bats that are made of styrofoam. They're about a yard long. They're orange with plastic handles. She goes to the other side of the room and she thwacks the futon with the bat baton. And she says, I'm angry. That's what you have to say. I'm angry. I'm angry. This is not fair. This shouldn't have happened to me. Just practice. And I'm thinking, I don't feel angry about my mother being paralyzed. I barely remember it. Everything was fine after this happened. She never was paralyzed again. But if I have toxins in my body that I have to release through thwacking this futon, then I am going to do it because no one has ever made this connection before. So uh, Brenda goes to the other side of the room. I face the futon and I say, I'm angry. I'm, it's not fair. And I'm thwacking and I'm trying to feel it about my mother being paralyzed and I'm not feeling it. But then I, because, probably because of the hormones, I start thinking, I am angry. I, I'm, I'm angry about doing all this to my body now to try to get pregnant. I, I am angry. I, this isn't fair. This is expensive. This is something I don't want to have to be in. I'm angry and I'm thwacking and thwacking and thwacking and thwacking this futon. And I start to get really heated up and sweating. I'm, I am angry and I'm afraid. I'm angry and I'm afraid. And then I feel suddenly very self-conscious and I turn around and I, to, to, to get direction from Brenda. And this is Brenda. She's totally asleep. She is asleep. And, and so I've been screaming for so long that there's a little drool coming out the side of her mouth. And, and I stop and I say, Brenda, Brenda, are you okay? And then she, she just arouses herself from sleep and acts like it never happened. She says, oh, and then you were angry when you saw the wheelchair that your mother was. And I, I think she just acted like she didn't fall asleep and I am now coming out of this trance that I was in and I say to myself I have to leave I have to get out of here and I say Brenda this, I think we've gone far enough 
I have to go. And she says, you have to release these toxins. You have to release many more toxins. You've only begun. I say, no, 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 I, I have to go. And I don't want to pay her because I now think she's a fraud, but I pay her so that I can get out of that apartment because I cannot remember where the door is or how many locks are on that thing. And so I give her a check and she leads me out. She's bemused and confused, but she's got her money. And I leave and I, I'm on the Long Island Railroad on my way home. And I'm thinking, wow, I just paid $500 to a probably um, fake PhD therapist, uh, Stevie Nicks wearing, <laughs> hair running with wolves uh, woman, who told me that the reason my body paralyzes sperm is because my mother was paralyzed. That is an act of desperation. I never saw myself in it undertaking. I don't think I can ever tell anyone about this except Danielle. I'd love to tell Danielle all about it. And Danielle takes my insurance. <laughs> and I realize that this is the beginning of a whole new chapter in my life. And I do return to Danielle and, and she's right. There are so many roads to go down in life. If you have to give up one dream, you have to give, to give life to another one. And that's what I did. I never went for the in vitro fertilization. I stopped taking all the hormones. Wow. I began to embrace my life as a woman who has other roads to go down. And it's been a wonderful life since I stopped pursuing that. It's been good and filled up with creativity and, and, and life. And I always had Danielle. When I looked at her, she gave me hope and she made me feel everything's going to be okay. Jude Trader Wolf. Oh my gosh, always phenomenal. Thank you. <laughs> Someone pointed out that this is, uh, there's a lot of therapy happening in the show <laughs> today. I think a lot of us on the risk staff. Are in therapy. I think a lot of people in the risk audience think of risk itself as a bit of therapy. I know that I always run my own stories by my therapist to like pick them apart before I tell them on the show. Uh, so quite a trip, quite a trip. All right, guys. Now, this is the part of the show that we're going to informally think of as intermission, which means, you know, for the next three to five minutes, if you do want to go to the bathroom, <laughs> my mine is right there, like three feet away. Um, if you want to go to the bathroom or grab a drink or pet the cat or whatever, now is a good time to do that. I am going to give a few more trivia questions, including one that will include a prize. Um, now, yeah, why don't I do a few trivia questions first, and then I'll tell you what the one that will win a prize could be. And so Kevin, we do see. have, we have, well, we have two spots to give away, two prizes to give away, so you might want to do it for two questions if you can. Oh, okay, so we'll do two different questions to give away prizes to, uh, in this little round of trivia. Let's start with this question. Which popular risk storyteller told a story about happily playing as a child in a dumpster of medical waste? <laughs> oh my goodness, let's see. Are people, do, yeah, 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 someone I'm named it right away. Uh, Jen something or other. Ray Christian, of course. Uh, I think that. I think that story is called Child's Play. Uh, what famous award-winning actress told a story on risk about dealing with the delusions of her bipolar father? That's a good one. Uh, yeah. Uh, wow, there's a lot of different... Uh, no, that's fascinating that a lot of people think it's uh, Carrie Kenny. Nope, nope, no, Meryl Streep. <laughs> yes, uh, if we could get Meryl on the show, that would be phenomenal. Someone mentioned her first name there. 
Does anyone know her last name? An award-winning actress who told a story on Risk about dealing with the delusions of her bipolar. Yep, you got it. It's Lily Taylor. Lily Tomlin is another person I would love to have on the show. I like how you guys assume that we can get uh, all of these A-list uh, Hollywood celebrities on the show. <laughs> um, let me give uh, one now th to which we can give a prize. Now, in order to get this prize, you first, don't bother answering the question if you're not interested in the prize. The prize is going to be uh, a spot in an oncoming storytelling for business workshop of ours. It is going to be a two day live online like this storytelling for business workshop with Gigi Lee, with Gigi Lee is one of our faculty members, you've heard her on this before. It is on 425 and 426 uh, from 1.30 to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 10.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific Time. That's a two-day live online group storytelling for business workshop with Gigi Lee on uh, April 25th and April 26th, right? Uh, okay, so if you're into that and you are the first person to answer this trivia question, you can, you'll have a free spot in that class, um, which is a big deal. I don't know how much that class costs normally. 150. What? 150. $150, so that, that's big, okay. So let's see what the trivia question here is for that. Uh, before becoming a box office star, this actor told a story on risk about wearing a spaghetti strainer on his head to combat a potential ghost in the attic of the house he was living in. Who is that actor? <laughs> before becoming a major uh, box office. Oh. Someone got it. It's Kumail yes. Nanjiani. You got it. You got it. You got uh, so it. Viana Rosenberg, please email Kevin at risk-show.com and claim your prize, okay? Okay, fabulous. Um, oh, that's a hard one. This next one is maybe too hard for people. Uh, oh, this is a great one. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, a, a inside baseball for, for those of you who are fans of the whole Risk and Story Studio staff. Okay, so now this is the other spot. If you are really interested in maybe being in that Storytelling for Business workshop, uh, answer this question. And if you're the first to answer, you can get a slot in that shop, in that uh, storytelling work done. So, you know, storytelling for business, uh, those are people working on, you know, job interview skills. They're working on maybe a project that they want to introduce to the world and they want to tell a narrative about it, or they have some project they want to like convince their team to get all excited about. So they want to tell a story about that, all that sort of like communication in the business realm where you want to be more emotional and human and, and take people like get people actually on your side rather than just telling them a bunch of uh, data and all that kind of thing. Okay, so this question is, two of Risk's story coaches and story, tell, uh, story studio instructors are, of all the crazy things, married to each other. Who are these two Risk story coaches and instructors who are married to one another? Oh, we got somebody who got it. Yes, Brad Lawrence and Cindy Freeman, who are watching the show right now, I believe. Um, uh, Brad and Cindy helped us cast the show today. So fabulous. Yes. Brad John, and Cindy. please email Kevin at risk-show.com to uh, claim your prize as well. John Blesso, email Kevin at risk-show.com to claim your prize. Fabulous. So that, I think, can wrap up our little intermission here. I hope everyone's back from the bathroom. And now I want to return to the show. I'm so thrilled about our next storyteller. And by the way, this is absolutely fabulous. Uh, Dixie De La Tour, who you know from Body Storytelling, 
later today, Body is also doing a live on stream as well. Uh, that will be 7 p.m. Pacific time, 10 p.m. Uh, Eastern time. And oh my gosh, Body is such a treat. It's I've we we've done shows with Body before, and I've appeared on Body before. Just always so much fun. I am going to be there tonight to check out uh, uh, the Body show at some point. And let's see, ba -ba 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 -ba. Uh, Dixie, she's been hosting Body. Uh, it's it, it predates Risk actually, and is an award-winning podcast now as well. So, Dixie, are you running your uh, microphone? Did you put, make your microphone levels good, and are you recording? I turned on my microphone. How's my audio? Does it sound okay? Uh, does it sound okay, guys? Sounds good. Okay, great. Okay, so, uh, without further ado, let us welcome to the virtual stage, Dixie De La Tour! <laughs> Boy, this is a dirty show, isn't it? <laughs> and sperm and bathhouses and bungholes all over the place. <laughs> well, guess what? It's going to keep going that way. Woo! How do you have a first date with somebody that you've already fucked, but you've never actually met? <laughs> back up. I went to this pitch dark sex party, and in the dark, I fucked a stranger. The only definable trait that he had was that he had this crazy thatch of coarse hair. I'm leaving the party and as I'm walking out, I see the event producer standing by the front door. He looks kind of like a baby faced blue eyed Billy Idol. And I see that bleach blonde hair that's erect. And I know, and he knows, we fucked each other in the dark. <laughs> So the next Monday, a few days later, he's the event producer. He sends me an email that Monday in early April, and he says, hey, uh, can I get your number? And I send it to him. And he says, we haven't actually met. My name is Sean, and I really had a good time with you the other day. And I was wondering if you'd want to go on a date. And I say, hell no, I don't want to go on a date. And he's like, why not? And I'm like, Dates are forced. They're awkward. I'm not a fan of first dates. I prefer anonymous sex. And besides, how would that work? We've already fucked each other. Am I going to fuck you on the first date? I don't know how that works. Do you know how that works? That sounds awful to me. <laughs> I keep and eventually he says, look, I don't care if we fuck or we eat soup. I like you. Well, he said the magic word. He said soup, because I love soup. <laughs> so we make a plan. That Saturday night, I am going to go to Max's Opera Cafe. I'm going to pick up a couple of quarts of matzo ball soup. I'm going to bring them over to his house. We're going to try it out, have soup, no pressure. And so I'm really don't want to admit to him I'm scared. The reason I don't like first dates is because it's so much like, what if you don't like me? I hate that feeling of kind of being judged, feeling like I'm not sure where this is going. It's just a lot of pressure. But I've agreed to it and as the week goes on, the information that we're swapping, the text and the chats is getting really flirty. And at one point I say, so if we were to go there, what would you want me to wear that would like turn you on? And he says, well, I'm a big fan of like smutty underneath prim and proper. And I'm like, oh, so you want me to wear my garters and stockings underneath my vacation Bible school skirt? And he says, yeah, you have a vacation Bible school dress? Fuck yeah, do you have a Bible? And I'm like, somewhere from my childhood and he's like great wear that dress bring your bible i want you to read aloud from it while i go down on you you stop reading i stop eating 
okay, I can do that. Saturday night, I put on my open bottom girdle. I put on my thigh high stockings. I put on my black lace push up bra. I put on my black and blue high necked church lady dress. I head out to Max's. I grab a couple of quarts of matzo ball soup and I head over to Sean's house. And I sit there in a the car, getting ready to go in, and I'm having a panic attack. It's really easy to say you like somebody when you meet them in the dark, but we hadn't talked to each other. And we hadn't really seen each other except on the way out the door. Well, he didn't like me. But I grab the soup, I head to his front door, take a big breath, knock on the front door, and the door swings open. And there stands Billy Idol, dressed head to toe like the Easter Bunny. <laughs> Why are you dressed like that? <laughs> and he says, Oh, later on tonight is Bunny Jam. It's this big Burning Man Easter thing. Hundreds of people that go into it. And my roommate just finished my Easter Bunny suit. And I was trying it on before you got here. We had covered what I was going to wear, but we hadn't covered what he was going to wear. And now I'm on board because there's no way he knew that costumes were my thing. And I'm like, can you leave it on while we fuck? And he's like, yeah, as a matter of fact, she wanted to make sure I could pee while I was wearing it all night. So it's got a hole in the crotch. We can leave it on the whole time. So I follow him down the hall to his room, a little Easter parade, all our own. We go into his bedroom and all there is in there is a desk, a single chair and a futon on the floor. I sit on the chair. I put the bag of soup on the table <laughs> and the Easter bunny stands in the door with his hands on his hips. And he says, did you bring your Bible? And I'm like, oh yeah. I go in my purse, I grab my Bible. I have not seen this thing in a very long time. This was my childhood Bible. And so I had had to dust it off really good. You know, get on the bed. So I kick off my shoes, I climb on the futon, I lay down and he kneels in front of me and very ceremoniously, he flips back my full church dress and underneath there's black lace garter belt, stockings, no panties. Gives me a big smile. I have done really good in the clothing department for him. And he gestures to the Bible and he goes, okay, let's go. I pick up the Bible. It's been decades since I've seen this Bible. And as he starts to go down on me, I flip open the Bible randomly and read the first thing I lay eyes on. And it says, Set a guard over your mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door to my lips. Says shit like that in the Bible? <laughs> that sounds kind of dirty. I'm going, wow. And the oral sex is really good. He's really going to town. And I'm kind of forgetting about continuing to read the Bible. I've read a, a little bit and then my arm's starting to lower, lower back onto the bed. I'm getting into the oral sex. And all of a sudden, this Easter bunny pops up out of my vagina and he gives me a quizzical look. And I go, oh shit, right. I'm supposed to be reading out of, reading out of the Bible. <laughs> so I go, flip to a new section and I go, from the fruit of their lips, people are filled with good things and the work of their hands brings them reward. With that, he starts munching on my clit, shoves a couple of fingers up in there, and it is awesome. <laughs> Guy knows what the hell he's doing. I'm having a really hard time concentrating. But as I start slowing down on the reading, because the oral sex is getting really good, I see that head pop up again. He's got that stern little Billy Idol face with those Easter Bunny ears on, and he looks at me as if to say, you stop reading, I stop eating. So I flip it open to a new section. And this one says, the tongue has the power of life and death and those who love it will eat its fruit. <laughs> <laughs> and he is loving this. 
and he is going to town and I'm getting really close to coming. I don't know if I can hold on too much more. And this reading is very distracting. So I dig in, in a horny wrestler move. I kick my feet up. I put my feet on his shoulders. I throw the Bible across the room. I grab hold of those Easter bunny ears and I go, eat my pussy, you fucking rabbit. And we are screaming at each other. I'm coming on his face. I giggle when I come. He comes up out of my vagina. I say, let's go, let's see that carrot. And he slides a condom onto his dick and we go to town. He is fucking me hard. And I'm just like, oh yeah, oh yeah. Give me that, fill my basket Easter Bunny. Give it to me. And he's like, oh yeah, you ready to repent your sins? Is that what's happening? And I'm like, oh yeah. Oh my God, your eggs are so much bigger than I thought they'd be. And he's like, oh yeah, God, you just, baptized me with your juices, didn't you? And we are just being fucking ridiculous, screaming at the top of our lungs. And eventually, it's so good, and I can tell he's about ready to come, and I say, give me that cream filling. <laughs> and we come together, laughing, and it is ridiculous. And he flops down on top of me. He is covered in my pussy juice and sweat and spooge. His brand new costume is ruined. <laughs> and he lays down next to me and I go, wow, Christ on a cracker, that was good. And he says, soup? And I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot about soup. <laughs> you know, he's like, I forgot about the soup. I crawl over to the desk, I sit on the chair, I open the bag, and I pull out a quart of matzo ball soup for him and hand him a plastic spoon. It's still warm. My little Energizer bunny had been pretty fast. <laughs> he starts digging in and I start focusing on my soup, my childhood Bible right there beside me next on the desk. And he says, so what was all that protesting about? You didn't wanna go on a date with me. And you know, after you've screamed the contents of a Cadbury commercial in somebody's face while orgasming, <laughs> you can be pretty truthful with them. And I said, well, dates are hard because I really didn't know if you were going to like me or not. And he gives me a big smile with a mouthful of matzo ball and he goes, oh girl, I like you. You're weird. <laughs> so I get up, walk my dress back down, grab my Bible. He's got to head off to his party. And he leads me out to the front door, says goodbye. He's going to be covered with me at a party all night. And I love that idea. And as I walk back out to my car, I think, you know, maybe first dates aren't so bad after all. <laughs> <laughs> Dixie De La Tour. Oh my God, that is so crazy. <laughs> Always a blast to have Dixie on the show. That reminded me, I did once have a, a date once where I had negotiated with a fella on a kink app to. Uh, come on over and he wanted to tie me up. He wanted to tie me up with ropes, which is a thing that I love. And so I, I was like, sure, fantastic. Come on over to my place in Brooklyn and tie me up. And when I opened the door, he was dressed as Captain America, which had not been mentioned. And I don't know comic books. You know, I don't know like superheroes or comic books very well. And so I, I was taken aback a little bit. And I was like, oh, wait a minute. Um, so if you're Captain America, oh, what does that make me? Like, what, what role am I supposed to be getting into here? And he was like, oh, you're just going to be a guy who's getting tied up by Captain America. <laughs> 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 so uh, that was that was a relief. A guy who, for no particular reason, is getting tied up. 
by Captain America. Uh, okay, folks, we have just one final story for today. And then we're gonna do a little Q&A afterwards where you can ask any of the storytellers questions if you like. Uh, we've had so much fun at these Q&As after the shows so far. Uh, our next storyteller has told several really like super, super classic stories on Risk, both hilarious stories and super moving stories. And he's such an important part of the New York storytelling scene, someone who you can always count on to be showing up at shows and helping to build the community. Um, he is a Moth Story Slam winner, and uh, we've just, we're thrilled to have him back on the show for one of these live streams. Uh, Richard, I should ask, uh, are you recording? And is your mic level set? I am doing both right now. <laughs> Fabulous. So here from the Catskills, let's please welcome Richard Cardillo. Woo! Woo! Yay. Thank you all. Thanks so much to Kevin and everybody at risk for helping keep us sane through all of this lunacy. Um, I first met Peter at the car wash. Now this particular car wash isn't exactly a place you take your Subaru for a waxing. The car wash was the nickname for the back room of a really seedy, sleazy bar in New York called the Spike. I had recently left 14 years in a monastery as a celibate monk trying to pray away my gay, and I couldn't do it, so I left. And that's why I was in that back room. I found Pete, Pete found me, and we had a ball in there. I was going at it just like a monk who had a vow of celibacy for 14 years. <laughs> <laughs> we finish in the back room, we go to the bar, Pete's buying me beer after beer, he invites me back to his place and I go. And it was wonderful, it was everything I wanted and more. And within four short months, Pete and I started our relationship of 18 wonderful years together. It was a marvel. Pete was this force of nature. He had social activism inside of him like no one I knew. He was born and raised in Selma, Alabama, right at the cusp of the civil rights movement. So he had activism coursing through his veins. And he'd protest for anything, no noobs better health care for people, uh, better wages for people. He was out there and he dragged me along to every one of those protests. And I'd be at his side and I loved it. At the end of those protests, he'd invite some of his colleagues, his compadres, back to our apartment for a meal. And the centerpiece of every one of those meals was my bread. One of the things I left the monastery with was this ability to make bread and it became my passion. I would make bread for everything and Pete wanted to instill that and keep that going. So he had my bread be the center of every one of the meals that we had together. It was great. I was going at it making bread for him. He was going at it trying to change the world the best he can. About a year into our relationship, Pete developed this real bad case of pneumonia in the middle of the winter. He got over it. Then he started getting neuropathy in both his legs. Then his eyesight started failing. And we kind of saw the handwriting on the wall. Pete had never gotten tested for HIV AIDS. So we both went together and sure enough, he tested positive for HIV AIDS. He fought it like a trooper. The doctor got his health back as best as he could. And he joined another protest group, those wonderful warriors from ACT UP. And we were on the streets together, militant as can be. And after every one of those marches, the ACT UP members came back to our apartment and there was more bread. Pete even wanted to make hospitality the center of our relationship. So once a week, he insisted on inviting homeless people from the Lower East Side where we lived over to our house for a meal with that bread. Very shortly after that, one other horrible thing started happening. Pete's mental health started deteriorating. He had this horrible, horrible opportunistic infection that was called toxoplasmo 
toxoplasmosis. It affects lesions and, and areas of the brain dealing with mood. And he just would sink into these deep, deep, dark depressions. And he would cycle in and out of psychiatric hospitals. And I saw this love of my life, this spark, this person who gave energy to everybody just fading away. And I didn't know how to go on with that. In August of 2012, Pete had just gotten out from spending five months committed to a state psychiatric hospital. He came home. I thought he was getting better. He was going every day to day treatments. And I went to work on one particular day. I gave him this prolonged kiss goodbye, told him I'd be cooking that night for dinner, and went off to work. And about noon, I get this phone call on my cell phone. And it's Pete. And I hear all of this traffic and wind. And I said, Pete, where the fuck are you? And he said, listen, Richard, I just wanted to call, let you know how much I love you, and I'll see you tonight. And he hung up. I didn't feel good about that phone call. So much so that I just left work and went home to wait for him. And about three to four hours after that, two police officers were at my front door, and they gave me the really ugly news that Pete had jumped from the George Washington Bridge, that they had recovered his body, and I had to go with him, with them, to identify the body. And I just collapsed. When Pete died, a big chunk of me died with him. I just closed down. I stopped going to work. I stopped talking to family and friends. I became a hermit in my own house. It was really my first taste of what we're going through now with social distancing. I just didn't want anybody in my life. About six months after that, on this frigid, cold December morning, I woke up to make some food and I realized I had no food in the house, but I had flour, water, salt, and yeast. So I did what I knew how to do. I made bread and old habits die hard. I made a lot of bread. I made eight baguettes and I ripped the end off of one of them, ate it and immediately felt really, really stupid. The rest of these loaves were just gonna go sour and go stale and I had nobody to share it with. The next morning I forced myself to put on my winter coat and my boots, and I trudged the eight blocks to the Bowery Mission to just donate this bread to homeless men. I opened the door to this center, and the guy at the front desk starts bellowing at me, hold on, no way, Department of Health rules, we can't accept food donations from anybody. So I left there feeling even more stupid. And I went to the park on Christie and Stanton to sit on a park bench in the snow and just have a real good crying jag. But I stopped and I turned around and I realized four men from the Bowery Mission had followed me into the park. Oof. One of the men circles me, looks me straight in the eye and points. And he simply asked, you got bread? <laughs> I opened the bag of baguettes, took out the bread, broke it, gave it to each of the men, and they devoured it. Not a word was spoken. Not a thank you, nothing. They're, they're, I'm, they're finishing up, I'm putting the bag away, and I get up to go. And that same man came up to me, pointed to me again, and said, you're gonna be back next week? And I said, I would try. The following Sunday, I showed up with eight loaves of sourdough bread. And the guys were already waiting for me. And this time, there was an awful lot more talking and laughing and sharing. They were connecting with their bread memories. One guy said, I remember living down south, and my grandma would make this cornbread in a skillet in the oven. I said, well, I make that kind of cornbread in a skillet. I'll make that for you next week. And another guy said, I remember when I was on the Lower East Side, I'd run home for Sabbath, and I'd rip a piece of the challah and get it before anybody else. I said, well, I make challah. I'll make you some challah bread. 
in the ensuing months, there were an awful lot more requests for bread and an awful lot more fun. My moniker became Bread Man. And I'd be a block away from that park and I'd hear that chant go up, yo, Bread Man, what you got? And I'd hold it up and say, chocolate babka week. Yo, Bread Man, what you got? Today's pumpernickel day. And we eat and we commiserate and we talk about the world. They got to know me and I got to know them very, very well. And there was this change in me. I became lighter. I went back to work. I started laughing again. I entered back into the world. And I really had nobody to thank for that but these men who made me see that I am one of many on this beautiful, clear, blue sky May morning. I go into the park and I hear, yo, bread man, what you got? I hold up the satchel and I said, a whole lot of ciabatta. One guy said, ah, shit. I had a hankering for your focaccia bread. Uh -huh. We all started laughing. Another guy said, not I. I've become partial to your country pond rustique. And we howled even louder with that one. Another guy bellows out, yo, bread man, you performed a miracle. You converted these crack addicts into connoisseurs. <laughs> we just died on the ground lap. It was crazy. That was not a miracle. There was a miracle that did happen, though. It was the multiplication of the loaves. I wasn't making more bread. They were sharing it out more with more people. And I still say the bigger miracle was the miracle inside of me. I had become one of a team now, one of many. And it made me think back of how Pete wanted to change the world and wanted to change minds. And I stopped and I said, my mind was changed. Now I can help others to change the world. And I'm pretty sure Pete would have loved it. Thank you. Woo! Oh, man. Richard Cardillo, that was so beautiful. Oh, my goodness. That got me in so many ways and so wonderful. Such a wonderful story to be sharing right now as we're trying to connect as best we can during social distancing. This is really a time to be looking into ways to connect with those who are more vulnerable because holy cow, this is quite a period for all of us, but especially those who are more, more at risk and more vulnerable right now. I had a little miracle on my end too, and that is I was able to keep this guy pretty quiet throughout he, he was mm -hmm. he was trying to meow i've been i've been giving him as many pets as possible to keep him quiet mm -hmm. but i might need to let him out into the hallway where he likes to adventure thank you so much everyone this has been such a wonderful for us <laughs> afternoon <laughs> for will in london and evening oh my gosh this has been yet another absolute wonderful treat of a show to share with you I it means the world to me I know like I, I leave these shows feeling so much more connected and so much more inspired and so thank you so much let's hear it for all of our storytellers today Just phenomenal. Uh, we got a lot of therapy and we got a lot of sex and a lot of craziness and even some some love and some tears in there. So really beautiful show. Um, now we're gonna have about a half hour of Q&A. So if you would prefer to, you know, take off, that's perfectly fine. The show itself is over. Uh, but if you're interested in asking myself or any one of the storytellers or even someone on the risk staff, if they're here, like JC, a question, this is a great time to do that. And I think JC will take over the, the reins of, of uh, doing the curating of the Q&A here. Yeah, um, great show, everybody. That was so awesome. Thank you all. 
um, my mind just went blank. But yeah, um, oh yeah. Uh, so uh, to all the audience, uh, Jesse, I, I'm not. Are 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 you spotlight? Oh, sorry, let me cancel the spotlight. Okay, now you should see everybody on gallery view. Did that work? Is everybody seeing everybody on the screen? I don't see Dixie. Uh, storytellers, yeah. are you hearable? Can you hear me? Oh, hello. Can, yeah. can, can someone oh. write in the chat if you can see all of us now? Yeah, and did everybody? Someone said they see all of us. Okay. Did everybody put your mic back up to automatic? I think I need to yeah. do that. Um, I did. Yeah, one second. I'm gonna put my mic up here. Is that is everybody hearable? Can everyone say something one at a time? Maybe Jude say something. I'm at automatic. It sounds very quiet, but maybe if you keep talking for a moment, it'll. Okay, okay. I'll. T um, I'm. I, I put it at automatic. Remember, my my computer wasn't as. I don't know. Okay. Oh, let me remind everyone about uh, mostly true things. Jude's show is at uh, four Pacific time and seven Eastern time, and you can go to mostlytruethings.com to Thank get you, tickets. Jeff. And then Dixie's show, Body Storytelling, is at 7 p.m. Pacific time and 10 p.m. Eastern time. And that's at bodystorytelling.com. So be sure to check out even more stories today at those phenomenal shows. Yeah, and Dixie, I hear your show is sold out for today. So I don't know if there's any way to make any more tickets available. A lot of people still want to get them. I think that Zoom controls that. I don't think I get to control that. And I didn't know it was sold out. So thanks for telling me. That's so cool. Um, yeah, I guess you have to get a, a more expensive Zoom account for a higher capacity of uh, webinar attendees, but that's I a good problem. I think I'm going to have to. I'm going to have to move up to risk level. Yeah, well, I, I think, what, what level are you at? How many attendees were you allowed to have? 500 because I'm learning all this. And I didn't okay. want too many witnesses to the fact that I don't have any fucking idea what I'm doing. Oh, well, that's fabulous then. I mean, that, that, to, to know that you're sold out, that's fabulous. Yeah. Awesome. Um, yeah. And someone was asking in the chat, when's the next Risk Live show? It's on Saturday, April 25th at 8 p.m. Eastern time. It should be on the Risk uh, tour page at risk-show.com slash tour. Um, cool. So uh, we're going to start our Q&A with questions for the storytellers about their stories. And then later we can go off into crazy town and ask about cats and, you know, rimming and whatever else you guys need to know about <laughs> and rimming cats if other cats do that hopefully none of you do um so uh okay so somebody's asking uh ryan is asking richard i have a question is richard still delivering as a bread man very interesting right after that happened about six months after i went back to work and kept making bread those guys finagled me to teach them how to make bread they don't need me anymore <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Amazing. That's awesome. Um, some people are saying that the view for them is switching back and forth from who's speaking, and some people are seeing galleries, some people are not. Um, you may have pinned a, sto uh, a video on your end, so just make sure you haven't pinned anybody's video. Other than that, it may be that just people see things differently, and you know what? That's what makes the world interesting, so as long as you don't mind it, it's okay. And um, okay, so uh, someone's asking, where was that question? Um, someone's asking, was there ever a second date, Dixie, with uh, Billy Idol Bunny Man? Uh, there was, and I started helping him to throw the Darkness Falls party. So we started becoming event producers again and getting everybody laid at the same time. Nice. <laughs> Fabulous. Cool, cool, cool. Um, I'm just looking through to find the other questions. Uh, someone's asking, um, yo, bread man, would you consider doing YouTube bread making classes? Ah, oh, there's too many good ones out there. I'm just a hack. I make about 10 loaves a week and just give them away. But to teach how to do that online, Forget it. And ever since I've been in the witness protection program, I don't like my picture. No, I'm only kidding. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. um, Genevieve is asking, Will, what are your current methods for dating? Dating apps, IRL? Like during, in the time of COVID or just in my life in general? Well, I guess both. <laughs> uh, in the time of COVID, it's, uh, it's a little thin on the ground. Um, <laughs> I guess Instagram. <laughs> um, Actually, somebody on Instagram did ask me if I wanted to like have a FaceTime drink, like glass of wine, and I and I, in the politest way possible, I just said like, it's awkward to FaceTime people I've known for like ten years. I, I the idea of FaceTiming first date makes me want to spoon my own eyeballs out. But you know, we'll probably <laughs> we'll probably have a drink afterwards. I guess I, I do. You know, to be honest, I am probably um, 
I'm trying to like get off Grinder and the dating apps and the bathhouse. I'm trying to just like meet people. So I guess just getting out into into the world. That's ridiculous. Only a weirdo does that. <laughs> 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 um, Ellen is asking, are there any tips on where to buy yeast on the black market, uh, uh, Richard? It's a hot commodity. It's, it, people are scrambling. Yeast in toilet paper. Impossible. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. Um, Jude, I loved your story because um, I, I actually never wanted to have kids. So um, I love having a child through life. Uh, do you want to tell us maybe some of your favorite parts of your life that you never expected, but now you're enjoying? Well, one of them is doing this. I, I started doing lots. I started, actually started, be, I became a cabaret singer uh, a, after I gave up the quest to have a, a child because, cap, because while, why not do another thing with futility that nothing you can't, that you'll lose at? No, I, I loved it. And I started doing um, music and, um, and writing and actually just to, I don't know, maybe to hook up to Richard's story just a little bit back, but um in night right after that thing happened with that therapist i was asked to write some material for an organization that was doing support groups for hiv and aids for families and people who are afflicted by or dealing with hiv and aids and i accidentally wrote a full-length play and that was inspired by the names project and we did this a tour of this play that was with music and then i did not know that i could write i didn't know that i could do it I tried, I did it, and then I just couldn't stop doing it. So I'm sort of grateful that I was put on that journey because I don't know if I would have, I never would have even tried because I didn't even imagine that that was something I could do, but they asked me and I said yes. And then I learned how to do it. And then we raised money for the Names Project for about uh, four years. So that was one cool thing that came out of it. Yeah, Jude, Jude has done some phenomenal solo shows that blend true storytelling with songs and i yeah it's a real treat if you ever have the chance to see one of those shows well that means a lot to me kevin because kevin coached me on those shows so. <laughs> <laughs> jc i can't hear you uh sorry daniel is asking kevin did you just smoke <laughs> no i i normally smoke during uh, some pot during the q a uh, of these things but it's uh it's not even four o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> for us so i don't think i'll be doing that <laughs> um colleen is asking uh, everybody how did you become storytellers and what do you think are the most important things to remember when telling stories I became a storyteller because I like to have crazy adventures. And then when I discovered there was a thing called storytelling, I'm like, oh, that's the reason I did all that shit. I never understood it. It was the best therapy I'd ever experienced. So I had a ton of stories and then I learned about this thing called storytelling. Yeah, I always knew that I want, that I love writing and that I want to write, but I always kind of struggled with fiction uh, because I get lost when I, when I try to write something fictional. I, it confuses me to like arbitrarily choose what characters are thinking and feeling. So telling true stories was very anchoring for me because you know i remember i remember how i was thinking and feeling and how other people were thinking and feeling so it really like uh, it just opened up a world for me there too i did uh something very strange because i was one of nine children and i never got the chance to talk so i went into teaching um and finally started telling stories. And the only started getting good for me when I realized the best stories I was telling were the stories where I stayed vulnerable. So that's the only mm -hmm. thing I learned. Yeah. I, I'll just say that when I wrote that, um, that play for the Names Project, um, we were on a shoestring budget and we had very, we just needed to have as few actors as possible. So I made one whole thing be a one, a, a solo piece that I did because I didn't have to pay myself. And I realized that I loved doing this writing stuff that I would say instead of being in plays that other people wrote. And then I decided why not say things that are true about me instead of making up. I just shifted over into wanting to tell 
things that were true. And um, then when this whole storytelling thing developed in New York, it was a real opportunity. And Kevin started giving classes, um, a, an opportunity to become proficient at it and to see it as an art form. And that was very compelling. Yeah, I, I always wanted, um, I, always, I always envied uh, people who seemed to have like a kind of creative tribe. Like I always uh, uh, looked at like, you know how like stand-ups always seem to like have like a regular bar that they go to and they know everyone there and they, they try out their new 10 minutes. It's probably like not nearly as romantic as I think it is, but um, I always envied that. And then, uh, and I thought I can't, I'm not really into writing stand-up, but I could write stories. And so I started going to the moth here in London and just loved it and just sort of kept going back. And I echo what Richard said, as soon as I started talking about the more vulnerable stuff, it was helping helping me deal with a bunch of um, things as well. So it's kind of win-win. Um, if I can just say, someone asked in the chat, uh, hey, Kevin and Dixie, have you considered doing things like this for us further away folks who can't get to the show? And they mean storytellers who can't get to New York City or to San Francisco, but would love to share their stories with an audience. The answer to that is, uh, storytellers from anywhere in the world have right. always been welcome to pitch us at, at risk-show.com uh, slash submissions. Anyone anywhere in the world can always pitch us a story at risk-show.com slash submissions. And we are absolutely, because we're considering now doing these live streams once a week, uh, we are very much looking for your pitches. So yeah, if someone is in Tokyo or Buenos Aires or um, Idaho or whatever, and you, you would want to be a part of maybe one of these live streams, send us your pitch. There's instructions there on how to do that. And you know, our coaches work with the storytellers. Everyone here this evening or this afternoon worked with Michelle Walson who is an absolutely phenomenal story coach on our staff. And so, yeah, we very, very much so welcome your pitches because we'd love to put you on one of these shows soon if you're thinking of it. Can I answer that question too? Yeah. Yeah. Um, we've always been limited to the people who could show up because all of the recordings on our podcast are told on stage. They're not like Kevin's, which are radio style. They haven't been yet. But the great thing about live streaming is now, like tonight, my lineup is, you know, I've got people in Chicago and Cincinnati and Portland and Denver are all going to be in the same show. Live streaming means the storyteller can be anywhere. So that means if anybody wants to pitch me, I'm Dixie at BodyStorytelling.com. I'm going to start doing this regularly too. Not as regularly as risk. I'm probably going to go every two weeks, but I need storytellers. So please pitch me your stories. I would love to be able to put the people who tell me they want to be on my stage on this on the live stream that's coming up it would make me so happy. And I just put our pitches link and Dixie's email in the chat. So if you need those uh, in written form, there they are. Um, Sierra is asking, Will, do you regularly go back to the bathhouses? What do your friends who aren't queer think of the bathhouses and have they ever been? <laughs> what do I what, sir? Um, do you still go back to the bathhouses regularly? And what do your friends who aren't queer think of the bathhouses and have they ever been? Uh, uh, the first question, um, no, I actually haven't been back uh, for, for maybe two, two years now, two, three years. I, I think I, I just got less turned on by it. Um, uh, I guess, but now actually that I'm in the time of, of coronavirus, I'm like, I'll just, you know, I'm just desperate to have some, to have some sex. <laughs> um, as I mentioned, quite a lot of us are. Um, uh, yeah, what do straight friends think? I think they're kind of like scandalized and curious and uh, kind of love to hear about it. Um, my, uh, my they don't go. I mean, I don't think you can really go into a bathhouse unless you, unless you want to, you know, see some stuff or do some stuff but my friend actually the other day she you know she told what to her was quite a um um out there story about a guy who who rimmed her you know well, on a sort of one night stand and um there was a few queer people in the, in, the, in the sort of audience this story and they were like 
yeah, that's, you know, that's not a, <laughs> that's not shocking us. She was like, damn it. <laughs> that's funny. Um, and let's see, uh, so Genevieve is asking, Jude, I'm close to someone who's currently going through infertility and struggling emotionally as she pro approaches her 40s. Do you have any advice on how to support her? Oh, uh, my advice for how to support her. Um, well, people are, you know, I think of infertility as this, it, boy, I'm, I don't know, I'm struggling for words. Uh, wherever people are in that process, they they it was, don't say th here. I know how things not to do. Don't say, well, you can adopt because if somebody's not ready to adopt, don't say that. Don't say just relax. Don't say it'll come if you just stop wanting it so much. None of those things are helpful and they're actually not even true. Um, and uh, that people want what they want and what even, even when to the point of desperation. Um, and uh, um, yeah, to be, to just accept where somebody is in their, where, where they are with it. I had so many friends go down that road and they went to one vitro in vitro after another, it didn't succeed. And with all of them, I was rooting for them deep down inside, not was pretty sure that they wouldn't, that at a certain point you have to stop because it's abusive to your body at a certain point. Um, it's just, well, tell, don't tell people how they should feel, I guess. Yeah. That's something minimally helpful, but. <laughs> yeah, sometimes it's good just to be a listening ear and sometimes people don't necessarily want a plan of action that you think makes sense for them, you know? That's right. And a lot of, it's so uncomfortable sometimes for people because they know how much you want it. They know what you're doing to yourself, your finances to make this happen. And they want to say, this will work and this won't, this will work. Right. And, um, and that can be, um, it, what you end up is feeling like you're supporting them by saying, good idea. <laughs> and it's not a good idea. Um, Nadia is asking, uh, you guys are all accustomed to the stage. Is that right? Uh, how is the experience of storytelling on Zoom versus with a live audience? I personally have really enjoyed it. I have been super, super surprised that it does tend to feel kind of similar. I mean, obviously, not being able to hear the whole room react is very, very different. You know, not being in physical space and looking into people's eyes is different. However, there is definitely the feeling of connection. You know, I think that, that looking into the green light of the, of the computer and then just seeing that there are people reacting in the chat, you know, just out of the corner of your eye, seeing that people are reacting in the chat, it just feels like you're speaking to a lot of people out there. And I think that's what ultimately matters, that you as the speaker, you know, have this feeling of, oh, they're listening. I, I am being heard. And so that's what ultimately keeps my energy up and, and keeps me alert and focused. And th that's what I'm riding. And, and I've been very surprised to see how gratifying it feels during these shows. Yeah. Any other thoughts from anybody on how the telling on Zoom experience was? This was my first one. Mm. This is weird. <laughs> weird. I can say the best part about it, all the technology is intimidating and everything, but the best part about it is I don't have Spanx on right now. <laughs> I'm wearing free pants, like sweatpants under this dress, and I'm loving that part. But do you have black lacy panties under your sweatpants? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's quarantine. I don't even know where they are. Yeah. Uh, um, Daniel's asking, does anybody have any details that were supposed to be in your story, but you forgot or skipped them? It's a good question. I'm pretty sure I forgot a few of the things that it had to do with rabbits and church that I was planning to say, but <laughs> I like to stockpile a bunch of different references and then just kind of go, oh yeah, don't cabbage, and then you say what you say, and then you go, well, I forgot like four of them, but that's cool. I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing that's really awesome about these shows is that uh, people who have various 
uh, like physical conditions that might make it harder for mobility and access to venues are able to come. Mm -hmm. um, and so Ryan is asking, are there any physically disabled storytellers, especially with speech issues? Um, yeah, I think so, right? Yeah. Familiar? Oh, yeah. I just saw a great, I don't know if we can give names of people here, but I just saw a great solo show by a New Yorker at Joe's Pub just before this whole thing. Uh, and you can Google him, Ryan Haddad, H-A-D-D-A-D. -D -D, and he just was at Joe's Pub and he is an amazing storyteller um, and does a great show and he's physically disabled. Yeah, um, uh, Grant Robinson is, has pitched us an anecdote, you know, on the, on the, if you listen to the audio podcast recently, we've been asking fans to also pitch us super, super short stories, you know, stories that are about three minutes and 30 seconds long. And Grant has appeared on the podcast before, but uh, maybe a year or, or maybe two years ago, he was in a car accident and has had a tr tr traumatic brain injury. So now his speech is very, very different. Um, but we are hoping to feature an anecdote about how he's dealing with COVID right now as being someone who has to deal with that at the same time that he's already dealing with, you know, his own medical issues and everything. And he's a great guy. Yeah. Um, we've also had a storyteller named Ann Thomas on Risk a few times, and she's in a wheelchair. Unfortunately, she's passed away now, but she told some beautiful stories. We also have uh, Chad Duncan, who went blind as an adult and told some fantastic yeah. stories about his experience uh, navigating that. Um, let's see, uh, Hina Moana Baker, I love your name, um, is asking, uh, does it need to be a story we haven't told live before if we pitch? I don't think so. I think pretty no, much every show, every show is happy to have a great story, even if you told it elsewhere. So, yeah. um, let's see, um, Shannon's asking, Kevin, when are you coming back to Milwaukee or Chicago? The mid Midwest misses you. <laughs> Yeah, I, you know, I love those places as well. We've had so much wonderful experiences every time we've come. And, you know, I've made some playmates in the <laughs> city as well that I would love to get back and see. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, a, that's all a big question of returning to being able to show up anywhere and do shows. You know, we'll, we'll have to see about that. Yeah. Um, someone's asking how many people came to the show today. It was about 250 signed in. Um, and uh, I think, I don't remember how many people were watching with other people, but there's probably around 300, 350 people watching. So that was great. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Uh, someone's saying we should keep live, live streaming shows even when we go back to regular live shows. Possibly. We'll see. We don't want to hurt attendance at live shows, uh, but, you know, we'll see. Um, Chris Burkett is asking, uh, Will, was losing your virginity to a woman as scary as losing it to a guy was? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, no, it wasn't as scary. Interesting. Uh, I was like 17 and she was Italian and I was infatuated with her. Uh, no, it's, you know, it's the expected thing, right? I mean, it's still scary, but it's what you're expected to do. Whereas, uh, you know, the gay thing is, is rife with uh, baggage. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great title for a story. story, rife with baggage. <laughs> Um, Malia, Malia or Malaya is asking, uh, did this live show have a theme? I don't think we're doing themes for these live stream shows, right? It's just whatever great well, stories. Well, I mean, the way it works with Risk is that when we invite storytellers to do the show, we will give them three optional words that they can, or, or you know, phrases that they can riff off of. So it might be like family, rage, or uh, isolation, you know, whatever, whatever. So, and see if something arises in their mind. I mean, we, we always think that Risk, the podcast, has its own uh, theme right away. It's tell us a story about something that you feel is kind of daring to be sharing because it's especially revealing uh, and the emotional high stakes are kind of there for you. So that's the way it generally works. Um, some, uh, Melissa's asking, has anyone taken up any quarantine projects? This, 
<laughs> right? Me too. <laughs> Changing everything about the way you do everything is a project. <laughs> yeah. 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 Lear learning how to avoid looking at the news sometimes. Oh. <laughs> um, Melanie's asking, will we continue to do webinar shows after COVID? I think so, because there's always going to be people in rural areas, people with accessibility issues, people in countries will probably never tour to. So I think we should definitely try. Um, again, we'll just kind of have to find a balance between not cutting into our live show audience too much, but also um, being accessible for people who will probably never get to a live show. Um, somebody, uh, Thomas is asking, is there a trick to taking something that seems simple and turning it into a story? Uh, let's see. Um, he's saying, like me saying to a crowd of 500 that he wanted to thank his mom, but he didn't include and his dad. I told him two, day, two years later that I was hurt and angry. Seems too simple to me, but, I, but can I turn that into a story? Yeah, if, you know, uh, so at our school, the Story Studio, we teach all kinds of workshops. And, and then I personally do one-on-one -on -one work with people meeting online like this for half hour or hour long sessions. If you go to kevinallison.com, you can sign up for a session with me. But some people, those sessions are just brainstorming. The session is zeroing in on one specific incident like that that you have in mind, and then starting to ask questions around it, questions for context, like, okay, but why did I react that way? What in my history made me feel the way I feel felt about that? And what was going on in the week or two prior to that happening that might be relevant? Or had anything like that happened before in my life or since? You know, like starting to ask questions like that, that a therapist would actually ask you, can start to like fill in a lot of the context and details around it and it starts to flesh mm -hmm. out. Um, but it's, it's super, super helpful to do that with, with someone or with a group of people, like our online classes where you can have a whole group of people like this with them asking you questions that might not even occur to the instructor, that's super helpful too. Mm -hmm. Um, so we'll probably try to wrap this up in like about five to 10 minutes. So I'm going to close questions uh, for now because we still have a bunch of questions that we need to get to. Um, so Daniel's asking Kevin and Dixie, once it's safe to travel, is there going to be another risk and body live show together or maybe an online live show together in the same in the next few months? Well, before Kevin answers that, I want to say that I would not be doing a live stream tonight if it hadn't been for their help. They've been giving me like best practices, what they figured out. This is your third one now, y'all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so they've worked out a lot of the bugs and they've shared that information with me. That's the only reason I've been brave enough to go ahead and have a live stream. And Kevin is sold out. And now it's sold out. So I love Kevin and JC. I love doing live shows with them. I love doing, I'll do anything they want me to do. Oh, we love Dixie too. <laughs> we do too. The, the show, the risk slash body shows that we've been together have been like some of the most phenomenal shows we've ever had the honor to be a part of. So yeah, we, we would love to. Yeah. Um, Olivia is asking if risk will ever physically come to Europe. Um, we have done London twice. Uh, not enough. It was like five years apart. Um, the rest of Europe, it's a tough question because it's basically like, are there enough people in Paris who want to come to an English speaking American storytelling show? Are there enough people who would pitch stories? I don't know, you know, Berlin, I don't know, you know? Um, and also it's expensive, obviously, when you can actually fly somewhere. Um, and like with visa issues, it's very complicated. So I think these will be much easier for us to do than uh, in-person live shows in Europe, but anything's possible and we'll, we'll try if we can. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, Kate is saying, hi, Dixie, your number one fan in South Africa here. Do you ever do international shows? Okay. I'm going to admit something to you. I grew up in a trailer park in the Blue Ridge Mountains. The <laughs> idea of going to another country is intimidating to me. Hmm. Uh, I want to. Out of the US? Huh? Have you never been out of the U.S.? I never have. And, you know, I mean, I never thought I was, you know, a podcaster. I never thought I was a live streamer. I'd love to. I'd love to, but it's just a matter of the limitations you put on your own self and what you think you're capable of, capable of and it changes every time. So by the time COVID's done, fuck yeah. <laughs> I'm ready to go anywhere. Awesome. Yeah. 
Um, Carly saying, uh, I have total hearing loss in my left ear. Kevin, um, I've listened to your show since the early days and I wonder what are your favorite sounds? Oh gosh, you know, I am such an auditory person that I, and I have such bad ADD that if I'm reading a book that I really, really want to soak in, I read it out loud into a recording device, <laughs> which means that I read books very slowly. Um, but you know, uh, sounds are also my favorite way to meditate, it, to use sound as an anchor, to just sit and listen to, oh, what's happening on that side of the apartment and what's happening on the other. I'll sometimes even do that on the subway, just sit there and listen to the wash of sounds in the subway car. Um, what are my favorite sounds? I don't know, that's, that's really hard to say. I, I love just sound in general. And you know, that's one of the reasons I'm so passionate about our radio stories, um, because there's so much going on underneath the storyteller and all the sound design that I always just find that such a thrill. Um, Roxy's saying, ladies, are you all doing your own hair during Corona? You all look great. Well, Dixie has a good story about that. <laughs> You have a story about that. Um, the last time I had my hair cut was right before my 13th anniversary, which was in mid-February. And it was crazy in my face and it was probably not any sort of red you've ever seen as well. <laughs> so my partner bent, um, we had a hairdresser that I knew who was very tech savvy, who was offering Zoom haircuts. And I booked him for a Zoom haircut. And my partner, who never cut hair in his life, he uses, you know, shaves his head with clippers, sat there and on Zoom, he was taught by a hairdresser, clip it like this, now like this, now like this, and gave me one of the best haircuts I've ever gotten. And he's never given a haircut in his life. What a trip. And then he bleached it, and then I made it red again. Yes. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, your hair is gorgeous. Thank you. Yes. And I have to say, I realize I love my hairdresser in Brooklyn, but I've been going to her way too often because <laughs> I haven't seen her in six weeks and I'm about ready and I'm cutting it myself. I'm trimming it just intuitively. And so far it's not a disaster. So I don't know what's going to happen in a week. I, 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 anything goes. It looks good. It oh, looks thanks. really good. So far, so good. <laughs> Will, Will was talking about Grinder in the age of COVID, and I had to laugh the other day. I, I do still go on Grinder. One of the reasons I like to go on is because people see that I'm a kink educator, and people like to just ask me questions. They want mentoring around kink, and I just love doing that. I love answering questions about kinky stuff. Um, but there was a guy with a hilarious grinder profile the other day. It was a straight guy, and his grinder name was Gay Guy Cut My Hair. <laughs> and his profile just said, Would one of you guys come over and cut my hair? Thank you. <laughs> um, I, I, my color has been fading like a mofo, and I'm going to be very, very late for my next color appointment. My uh, colorist keeps emailing me being like, hey, got to move it back another month. I guess we got to move it back another month. I guess it may never happen. And I'm just like, ah. So this morning I, I did overtone and put my purple back in because my ends were getting very blue. Yeah. So yes, I'm, I'm handling it myself for now. Um, Sierra says, have any of you, uh, well, I guess she's specifically talking to the queers. Um, she's saying, have any of you had bad experiences with people being rude or aggressive when finding out you're queer? How do you stop it affecting you? You know, I saw that question before. And the first thing I thought of after years of, you know, working with LGBT youth and harassment and bullying is when I think of my story, the most homophobia I have ever felt came from me. Mm. Once I started saying to myself, you know, after the monastery and all of that stuff, that I am wonderful the way that I am. I am supposed to be this way. This is who I am. It was not that much more than a hop, skip, and a jump to put up with the bullshit of other people and say, you know, hate is going to hate. But you know something? I had to accept me first. And once I accepted myself, I didn't have to put up with the bullshit as much. That's a great, that's a great, great, great question. And I found myself going, because I, I knew I was gay when I was a tiny little kid, 
So that was very traumatic, like growing up thinking that people would think I was a monster if they found out. And so it was, yeah, it was mostly internal homophobia that was so tough on me. But there is a story on, there's a risk episode called Queer, um, where I told the story of in my 40s, very unexpectedly, I used to live in uh, Ridgewood, Queens, and there was a man, there was a man with mental issues on the street who would scream faggot at me and would come up running at me screaming faggot. And, and it, one day he finally ran up to me and punched me in the face. And uh, it, it started to make my life very traumatic. It was so weird for me because I was in my forties and I thought, oh, I'm through with ever having to worry about that kind of thing anymore. But all of a sudden it was in my face and I was scared to walk around my own neighborhood. But the, I told that story on risk the day I was able to get him arrested. The police, the police walked me around Ridgewood as like bait and he came for me and they arrested him. So, wild. Um, uh, I had a lot of, uh, I, I mean the school I went to, which I mentioned the story was very, it was a very homophobic culture. Mm. Um, and I don't know if you have it in the States, but there's a, um, it, it, when I was a kid, it, everyone would be like, oh, that's so gay. Like, just to mean that's like a shitty thing, right? Mm -hmm. And so hearing that every day seeps into your brain. I've, I've had the odd, you know, like, uh, like I wear nail polish sometimes. I get the odd sort of homophobic comment on, on public transport or something. But sadly, it's, it's um, I think the most homophobic stuff comes, in my experience, from those who really care about you and are close to you. When I was coming out, it was people who were, really frightened about what that meant. And so they would try to kind of encourage me to not talk much about it or keep it to myself because they thought that would be safer for me and that would give me an easier life, which is ironic because that's like the most homophobic thing <laughs> you, know, you could do to somebody. <laughs> but sadly, I've, I've, you know, I, I was thinking to today, it took me ages to like, um, promote the fact that I was doing this show because I'm <clears throat> I still even now have like the ghost of that fear of like what if this person watches and they hear this about me and then they're gonna and actually it all comes like Richard said from from deep inside you it's it's an internalized um uh homophobia which is kind of once as you say once you're over that you're, you're kind of um free yeah oh what a lovely uh, <laughs> answers from everybody. Um, well, it seems like what most people are thinking about you right now, Will, is that you're very sexy. So. <laughs> oh, my, oh my God! Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm professional. I keep everything business. <laughs> are you slide into my DMs. You're very welcome. <laughs> I will. Do you wanna? Do you wanna see if you're still interested in ladies? <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty. Um, cool. Well, yeah, this was wonderful, you guys. Um, uh, yeah, Thomas Gleason says, I want to make out on Will's back porch. <laughs> wow! <laughs> I'll get it all clean for you. <laughs> um, so, yeah, this is awesome. Thank you all so much for sticking around. And um, our next Risk Live online show is Saturday, April 25th at 8 p.m. New York City time. So we hope we'll see a lot of you there. And please spread the word to your friends. You can always uh, buy tickets for a friend on risk-show.com slash tour um, by entering your friend's name and email and then paying for it yourself. And then they'll get the confirmation email to attend. Um, and follow us at, uh, at Risk Show on all social media, R-I-S-K-S-H-O-W. Um, any other things we should cover before we go? Pitches your stories if you want to be on one of these shows at riskdeshow.com slash submissions. Yeah. Wash your hands. Yeah, wash your hands. Wash your hands. Your elbow, all the things. And thank you for everybody to, for buying tickets to the Risk live stream and showing up. Some of, some of you, I'm sure it's the middle of the night for somebody. Yeah. So this was an amazing first European show, JC and yeah. Kevin. Yeah. It was yes. great. Yeah, really you guys are so really much for having us. Thanks to everyone. Support on Patreon. So thank you guys so much for that. So we'll see you next Saturday and much love to all of you. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye. Have a great afternoon, evening. You Bye. too.